Howdy, Egg Econ. Mr. Ramstead back again. Hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up Unit 1, as you probably have noticed. So we're going to finish off with one of my favorite econ topics that we'll see time and time again in the rest of the semester, uh, supply and demand. So we're going to get started talking about a case study with toilet paper. Then we're going to move into the perfect point as we look at supply and demand graphs and the anatomy of those and what the perfect point is. And finally, we're going to give you a surplus of knowledge about surpluses and shortages. So um, hang on tight. It's going to be a fun little ride for us today. Uh, as usual, we're going to get started with our learning targets, though. So uh, first, you'll be able to define the laws of supply and demand in your own words. You'll be able to evaluate a supply and demand schedule to determine the point of equilibrium. You'll be able to create and interpret a supply and demand graph, and you'll understand the effect of a shortage or surplus on a market. So first, let me mention it is currently March 2020, and as some of you may recall, March 2020 is when the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 was having a big um, impact on the U.S. and national um, and global economy, and this virus has had drastic tolls on uh, many individuals across the world, and um, as such, it's created a lot of concerns on the consumer market. People are going out and hoarding and buying a lot of um, supplies that they don't necessarily need to have um, in this moment. They're just going in um, out of fear and panic and buying a lot of things, and one of those things is toilet paper. Like Obviously, there's a lot of other things too, like canned goods that are um, being erased from the store shelves because people are buying them really quickly, so much so that they're not able to keep up with the demands. Uh, but toilet paper is a really big one and it's been circulating a lot on social media, so I thought we would uh, use that as kind of a little um, attention focuser and way to apply this concept to our real life. So um, if you want to follow along with me, feel free to click on the supply and demand um, arm wrestling political cartoon or you can just follow along here on the screen. The article is called Coronavirus Disrupts Supply Chains, but Toilet Paper Should Be Back Soon. And we're going to jump down to the second half of the article. Okay. As to the item of most concern to many people today, toilet paper, Du Hadway said, there's no good news there. Supply lines are disrupted. It's higher consumer demand and a moment of fear about the future that is leading to empty shelves. Traditionally, toilet paper has an incredibly stable demand pattern. We use the exact same amount of toilet paper as a society on a consistent basis, Du Hadway said. When there is a sudden spike in that demand, it takes some time for the supply chain to make that increase in production, he said. The good news is they are ramping up production, so we will likely see an increase in product. The same is true of other products being cleared from the supermarket shelves, as shoppers buy more so they can cook at home and limit trips to the store. His advice for shoppers? When you go into the store and see products that are depleted, focus on buying those products that are um, focus on buying products that are in excess. Excuse me, such as fresh vegetables if the canned beans are sold out. He said, prioritizing the products that are in excess will stabilize the entire system overall. And that, my friends, is how supply and demand works. And this political cartoon that's been used for many many years does a great job depicting that ongoing battle between supply and demand. We obviously want to make consumers happy. We also want businesses to stay in business and have enough money um, and not waste their products or not have their products end up being sold. So there's constantly a battle between supply and demand. Businesses are trying to figure out what consumers want. Consumers have minds of their own and so they just go into stores and go ahead and buy things. So there's a lot of careful research that needs to go into determining what prices different items are, and services are going to be selling for. So um, we'll get into that later this semester as well. So uh, supply and demand obviously are both, they work hand in hand together. We have to understand both of them. I like to start by teaching about demand first because each of us may not own a business and understand the supply side right away, but we each can appreciate the fact of going into a grocery store, or going to um, Ace Hardware or different um, companies and businesses and purchasing things as a consumer. So demand is the willingness and ability of buyers like you and me to purchase different quantities of a good at different prices during a specific period of time. Now, an example of this is the toilet paper case, right? So flashback to Tuesday of this week, I went to the grocery store in town and went ahead and I needed to purchase some toilet paper. I live by myself in my apartment. I don't um, stockpile anything by any means because it's just, just me and I'm pretty low maintenance person. So I was running out of toilet paper. I had a few rows left. So I'm like, I should probably go buy some toilet paper. Well, um, I got lucky. I was one of the last um, boxes or containers of toilet paper in the store. I got an eight pack and let me tell you, it cost me about 12 bucks. And for me, I think that's pretty, pretty darn expensive from what I normally pay for toilet paper. And two months ago, it wouldn't have been that expensive, right? So 
because there was so much demand for that product, the store then had to look at its supplies and see, okay, how much are we going to charge for this toilet paper to make sure that we can keep it on shelves for people who really do truly need it. So there's a lot of thought and strategy that goes into that. But um, because there's so much demand, they're not able to keep up with it. And we see store shelves that look just like that one. Okay. So the big deal questions. Okay. I'm going to get started with number one here. What might a demand line or graph look like? I'm going to tell you that price is always going to be plotted on the Y axis and quantity of the product is going to be on the X axis. So knowing that and knowing the definition of demand, do you think that the line is going to be going up, down, or straight across? The answer is demand to the dumps. Demand is always going to be generally downward sloping, kind of like the graph that we have here. Okay, so we notice here that at a quantity of 100, or excuse me, at a price of $2, a quantity of 100 chocolate bars are going to be demanded according to this graph, right? $2 is kind of a lot for a chocolate bar for most people, so it's kind of expensive, right? But if the store were to sell it for, say, $0.40 cents per candy bar, we can see that 500 would be demanded because that's a lower price and people are more willing and able to pay for a chocolate bar at that price. They're willing to give up their 40 cents for a chocolate bar at that price, but they're probably not as willing to pay a whole $2 for one chocolate bar. Okay, now obviously that depends on who you are. Like I personally wouldn't pay $2 for a candy bar, but if I'm in the checkout line and I see one for 40 cents, I'm more apt to put it in my basket and bring out with it. Okay, so that answers questions two and three. And the last one, what factors might affect a consumer's ability and willingness to buy a good or service? Okay, so think of your own life. When you're going to the grocery store, what makes you want to buy or not buy a product? Well, for me personally, since I live alone, I don't have a wife, I don't have any kids at the moment, I am buying food for myself. I only have my income too, so that limits how much I can purchase because I'm not making as much money as, say, a family of with two incomes coming in, okay? So that affects me personally. Trends, right? So I can tell you um, when I was born just a couple years ago versus now in 2020, um, there's a big demand increase for things like avocados, right? Because people are more interested. It's more trendy, if you will, right now to buy avocados and it's on toast. It's on pretty much anything, it seems like. Um, even though I'm not a big avocado guy myself, I know a lot of my friends and family members do enjoy avocado. So um, di different trends, time of the year. I'm more apt to buy things like strawberries and blueberries and watermelon in the summer when they're more fresh than in the winter time. So time of the year also affects um, when I'm more likely to buy something. So these are just a couple of things that affect demand. And I'm sure you can think of a long list of other items too. But just for now, remember that demand is generally downward sloping. And as the price goes up, the quantity demanded is going to go down. And as the price goes down, the quantity demanded is going to go up. And that's reflected here on this slide too. Okay, so now that we understand the law of demand, uh, after I give you some instructions, I'm going to have you hit pause and either go into the PowerPoint file and click on this link or type in z.umn.edu slash demand. And then you'll go ahead and play the demand simulation activity to kind of apply these concepts to another um, situation, okay? So do that for some practice and then come back here when you have finished. So now that we understand and have completed that activity and we understand how demand works and how consumers operate at the supermarket, we can now put on our business owner caps and look at the supply side of things. So supply is the willingness and ability of sellers to produce and offer to sell different quantities of a good at different prices during a specific period of time. So again, with this toilet paper scenario, the first thing that a lot of stores did is they put up signs next to their eggs, their breads, their toilet papers, and they said limit one or two or three per household or per transaction or however they word it. Um, this is simply to get people to stop buying and hoarding things that they don't necessarily like need and saving it for the people who actually do need it or running out at their homes. And then what they do after that is they jack up the prices to see who is actually willing and able to pay for those goods. So because they go back into their warehouse and they see they're running low on toilet paper, they're running low on butter, they're running low on these goods, they then can put limits on how much people can buy and then increase those prices. So that is how the supply side works. So looking at these big deal questions, feel free to pause and answer them on your own or stay tuned here with me and we can work through them together. Um, if demand goes down, supply is going to go 
up, right? They're inverses. So supply to the sky, as we see on the titles of these slides, um, generally speaking, businesses want to make money, right? So in this case study example with chocolate bars, um, the quantity that they're going to be willing to supply at $2 is 500 because they could make up to $1,000 in revenue there, right? Two times 500. Whereas they're probably going to be less likely to sell a higher quantity at 40 cents a piece, even though consumers probably would be more apt to purchase at 40 cents um, because they're not going to be making as much money there. 100 times 40 cents is only um, $40. So they're not making as much money there, right? So that's kind of how it works from a supply side of things. Okay. So um, if the price goes up, the quantity then goes up. And if the price goes down, the quantity goes down in terms of what they're willing to supply. Factors that might affect a seller's ability and willingness to supply a good or service, again, kind of similar to consumers, right? The time of year or the weather, those are big deals um, for determining what can be supplied, especially when we look at different commodities like corn and soybeans, right, um, at the store. And some other things that might go into effect too are the prices that the suppliers are purchasing it from their suppliers, which is, goes into the supply chain. Um, additionally, location, geography, all of these things influence um, their ability and willingness to sell things at a certain price. The other thing too that I didn't mention is the amount of stores that they're competing against in a specific town or location. That is also very important to consider. So again here, as price goes up, quantity goes up, price goes down, quantity goes down. Hit pause, complete that activity for some additional practice, and then jump on back here. Hopefully you can appreciate this quote now that we know what supply and demand is. Talk is cheap because supply exceeds demand. Very, very true. So now we get into understanding the perfect point. So this really is challenging for economists and grocery stores and suppliers to figure out, but when supply and demand are equal and all parties are satisfied. When we have a shortage, that means that there's not enough supply to meet the demand. And when there's a surplus, there's too much supply and not enough demand, okay? So it's very, very challenging to reach the point of equilibrium, but it can be possible in some economies and in some certain locations and times. So if we know that supply equals demand in order for um, point of equilibrium, what is the point of equilibrium on this supply and demand schedule? If you answered 300 or $1.20, you would be correct. And this can be confirmed on our supply and demand graph. So when the supply and demand lines intersect, <clears throat> that is our point of equilibrium. Okay, so go ahead again, hit pause and complete this activity um, for some additional practice or type in z.uma.edu slash equilibrium. And to wrap up, let's look at supply or surplus versus shortage, okay? So shortages, again, occur when there's not enough supply to meet the demand for a good or service. So an example could be um, very famous antiques or toilet paper. When there's a shortage, that allows us to drive up the market prices. And similarly on surpluses, um, when there is too much supply or not enough demand for a good or service. An example, unfortunately, today is milk. There's a lot of people competing in the dairy industry, and there's a lot of competition coming from a plant-based, not real milk alternative, such as almond beverage and soy beverage um, that are serving as substitutes for some people for milk products or dairy products. So there's a lot of short or surplus, excuse me, of true um, milk and dairy products simply because there's these alternatives that are in the market and because there's so many people producing milk right now in terms of small businesses or small farms and larger farms as well. So shortage lines are always going to be below the equilibrium and surplus is always going to be above the equilibrium because at surplus we are supplying above the equilibrium and at shortage we are um, supplying below the equilibrium. Kind of see that? So always look at the supply line if you get those two confused. So there you have it, supply and demand, both very great and important concepts we'll refer to back um, in this course. You've now successfully finished the lectures for unit one, so give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, check over these objectives, make sure you've met them and you know them. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in.